Well, hello everyone and welcome to another Sunday School Review. My name is Ricky Pitts and I'm teaching on behalf of True Deliverance Holiness Church where Bishop Nolan T. Torbert is the pastor, founder, and overseer. I want to thank you for taking the time out again to plug back into another Sunday School Review. We're going to jump into the Word of God and see what we all can learn and gleam and apply to our everyday living. So our, our su subject today is the nature of the kingdom. And we're coming from Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 23. A lot of information. So we're going to go ahead and jump right on in because that time is marching on pretty quick here. I want to give you a little context of our lesson for today. Paul's letter to the Romans addressed a church that was divided, a divided church, uh, divided between the Jews and also the Gentiles. And both of these are followers of Jesus at this point. And it appears that each group, each one of them, looked down on the other for the way they practice life in the kingdom, in God's kingdom. And Paul wrote a letter to let, to let both of them know that they both belong to the kingdom on the same terms. And those term were, terms were faith in Jesus and the good news about what he had done, uh, his death, his burial, and, and his resurrection. I want you to read uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 5, and chapter 10, verse 5 through 17. In a city like Rome, finding meat, yeah, meat to eat that was not cer ceremonially unclean or ceremonially clean was kind of pretty hard to do. And you add to the fact that the meat had been also offered uh, up to pagan gods, uh, the Jews at that time in Rome, many people feel that yeah, the, the Jews just gave up on meat altogether because they saw this as a, a very bad thing to do because it was offered up to idols. But in the mean, meanwhile, the Christian Gentiles, they had a Gentile background. They weren't subject to the, the laws of clean and unclean meat. But for the Jews that followed Jesus, they saw that dietary restrictions was like a sign of devotion to God. The Gentiles thought that was strange and didn't make any sense and very, very unnecessary. And that's what we find ourselves in our, in our verses for today. So if you would get your Bible or get your iPad, let's jump right in. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verses number 10. It says, but why doest thou judge thy brother? Or why doest thou set it no, thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, this is verse 11, said the Lord, every knee should bow, shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Verse 13, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not chari charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for, with, for whom Christ died. Verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Verse 17, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that is, for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who, who eat it with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumble it, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubted is damned, is damned if he eat, because he eat not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, in that very in that tenth verse, Paul asked a pretty serious, pointed question. I mean, why why y'all judging your brother? Pretty much is what, in layman terms. And, then, and here's another thing: why 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 doest thou set it not thy brother? 
we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. All of us going to stand before Christ one day. So in this verse, Paul asked a very direct question to clarify what was really at stake regarding certain kind of foods and certain kind of days of the week. And he has clearly shown that both the Jews and the Gentiles, or both of them, are guilty of sin. And both of them have, can be restored by expressing both of them faith in Jesus. So having said that, no Christian, regardless of their background identity, uh, can judge another Christian status uh, on other guidelines. Okay, these are our guidelines in our church. If you don't abide by our guidelines, I'm not talking about the guidelines of the word. I'm talking about our guidelines. You, you, you can't be saved. No, we can't, we can't, hey, hey church, we can't think like that, class. So it's, it's really important. Now, to say that naught is to treat other people as if they're not as important as oneself. So this verse then in context, in context, implies really two, two reasons for not passing judgment on other people. For the food that they eat. For the food that they eat. Now, we're talking about all this about the food that they eat. Number one, if there's any judging in regard to food choices, it's going to be at the prerogative of Jesus, not us. Number two, we, we will be, all of us are going to be called into account on the last day. On, on all the judgments that we have done, that we formulated, we all gonna be we all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I want to read what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10. I'm going to read this in the Amplified Version. For we, believers, will be called to account and must all, all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be repaid for what has been done in the body, whether good or bad, that is, each will be held responsible for his actions, purposes, goals, motives, the use or misuse of his time, opportunities, and abilities. Everybody gonna stand before Christ in, in, in the judgment day for all the things, all the deeds that we've done, every idle word. So ain't nobody gonna, don't worry about trying to pick that and say that, hey, God's got it all, and he's gonna be the, he's the final judge. Now. Keep on listening now so you don't think we're trying to justify doing wrong. Paul said in verse 11, it's written, as I live, not just, not said one of these other, not said Peter or John or Mark or Luke, said the Lord. Everybody that has a knee is going to bow. Everyone that has a tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so, so it's important that we know also that every one of us is going to give an account to God for ourselves individually. So the, this verse here is saying, as a, as a result of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus, the Lord ended, brought to an end, this deeper exile of sin. And sin, sin puts you in exile. Sin separates. And then as a result of the death and resurrection, he's made salvation available, not just to the Jews, but to the whole world. So ain't no human being got no patent on salvation. Salvation just don't belong to, to one, one people group alone. It's for everybody. Now, we, we, we can take taking the word out of context. We can do that too, you know. This, today's culture to take it out of context is always quoting Matthew chapter seven, verse one and two. Don't y'all judge me. Don't, don't, don't. Hey, hold it. You judging me. We can take the word about a context because we want to do what we want to do. So they want, they want to disallow all Christians from any kind of judgment, even though the judgment is based on pure ethical observation in certain circumstances of class in certain Situations, judgment is justified and judgment is necessary. Is this a conflict? Is this a is this a contradiction? No, it's not. I want y'all to read Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20, and read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 5. So sometimes that we have to do that. Then also sometimes we can have a certain membership in a certain group. And that whole group say, 
what you what you the way you're doing it is wrong because you're putting on black shoes you should wear brown shoes and and the reason why i know you're wrong my whole group say you're wrong well now let me say this every group because it's a big group don't mean it's right we can't we can't follow the crowd we can't justify a wrong because the majority said it's right let me read what exodus 23 and 2 says it says you shall you, you shall not follow a crowd to do something evil nor stand you nor nor shall you testify at a trial or in a dispute so as to side with the crowd in order to pervert justice justice that's exodus chapter 23 and verse number two so just be, keep that in mind as well in 13 paul told him said look let us not let, let's not judge one another, but here's what I want y'all to judge, that no man put no stumbling block, no occasion to fall in his brother's way. That's what I want y'all to judge. You see, judging fellow believers is to give way to caring for them and looking out for their benefit. It really does. It really does. So Paul uses figures of speech to caring. Paul said two things, a stumbling block. A stumbling block class is just plain and simple, something in the way to make that brother trip, plain and simple. An occasion to fall is the same thing, an obstacle in the way to make, in, in that brother's path, a sister's path to make them fall. So Paul, what Paul is doing here is Hebrew parallelism, pretty much saying the same thing, but the same destination, same thing that has the same meaning. Stumbling block, occasion to fall, something is in the way. Paul said, don't do it. In verse 14, Paul said, listen, here's something that I know. I don't ring, I don't guess, I know, and I've already been persuaded. I'm, I'm conviction-driven by the Lord Jesus Christ. Not Peter, not, not John, not Luke, but the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that nothing really in and of itself is unclean. But to the one that put it up or esteem it as unclean to him, it's unclean. So, so this verse reflects what the Lord Jesus declared in Mark chapter 7, verse 14 through 23, which is that purity is not about the food that you eat. It's about what's on the inside, the inner character. What's on the inside, the character that nobody can see when you're at home, the character, the, the, the public and the private. So Israel then, Israel's rules regarding what was clean and unclean and what they should eat, what they shouldn't eat, was not for everybody. It was for a, it was for their cultural boundaries. And it defined Israel as a distinct people, a distinct nation. But it, they tried to put that same dietary rule on the Gentiles. Romans 14 and 2 says, you know, establishes this that the one who esteemed anything to be unclean is the one who is weak in the Christian faith. So they, they haven't yet reached that, that point of being fully accepting the truth that things on the outside, like food, don't make a person unclean. Thing, things on the outside, such as food, don't make a person unclean. But if that same person's conscience still considers this stuff to be unclean, well, to them, it's going to be still unclean because it comes against their what? Conscious. I know this sounds, it can be somewhat confusing. But it's not. We just got to read and study the word of God. In 15, Paul said this. Now, let me just stop right here and intersect this. If your brother is all upset because of the meat that you eat, you ain't showing no love if you just keep on eating that meat just wide open because God also died for this guy over here as well. So the word grieve then in this verse indicates something that's a whole lot more big of a deal than just being sad and just being irritated. Why? We see the word destroy. So you got a, you got a person here, you got a person right here that's a, a, a child of God, a born again Christian, just acting in a visible way that's going to violate the conscience of this weaker brother over here. And that can that can result in this weaker brother over here having spiritual problems, spiritual destruction. And Jesus died for this young man, this young woman. So just don't, don't, don't do something that you know going to irritate, aggravate, 
and cause them to fall off the wagon, really fall off the wagon. So this, this subject ain't no real little, little light matter. This is a pretty big deal right here. This ain't no light situation. And it goes to the very core, the center of the gospel. So we are, we are all called in to a high regard and a high regard for the conscience of our fellow believers. We, we got to have a high regard. And the, the regard got to be sometime higher than our own regard for our own selves. We got to be concerned about how we can, what we do, how can it affect other people negatively. So Paul has a whole lot more to say about this in, in his book in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 7, 8, verses 7 through 13. In verse 16, Paul said, Don't look, just don't let your goods what you're doing, be evil spoken of. Those down there in Rome who understood that Christ had already set aside these rules about clean and unclean food, they had a real good tight grip on God's truth. Food ain't gonna do nothing to you. But they, they had grown to that, that level and they was ready to act on their expression of their faith, ready to make a move. But now if they act, and have no concern for the other group that has not yet grasped this truth that still think, man, if you eat that food that was offered up to idols, and it, that, that stuff going to get on you. I mean, that stuff is going to contaminate you. It's going to make you unclean. If they went ahead and did that just anyway, it's going to affect that other group. See, and, see, and, and the phrase also is we see the word uh, good actions, be evil spoken of. Good actions can be evil spoken of. That phrase is also translated from a word that we all are familiar with. That word is blaspheme. You, we, we, we don't never blaspheme against the Holy Ghost. I want you to read Romans chapter 2 and verse 24 and 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 20. Blaspheme is a very strong word for an insult. Not just an insult, but an insult against, against something of a much higher standing higher esteem is to insult them. And the implication is that any of us can provoke slander. We can provoke and promote slander. And it could go all the way up that slander to Christ himself. And we, if we get too careless, just, just as if we don't care about what, well, about what Paul is teaching, the so-called Christians that have grown to a certain level of understanding to know that these things are superstitious and they don't have any effect on your salvation. But if they don't believe it does, they think it does, well, to them, it does. In verse 17, Paul said, for the kingdom of God is not by what you eat and by what you drink, but here's what the kingdom of God is about. It's about righteousness. The kingdom of God is about peace. It's about joy in the Holy Ghost. So Paul now uses three critical terms to characterize the kingdom of God. The first one is righteousness. Just do what's right. Dr. King said the time is always right to do what's right. The other word is translated peace is assurance. At the end of this journey, it's going to be some assurance on the end. I want you to read Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. And in God's peace, the peace of God is not just the kind of peace that's going, going to remove strife out of the way. The peace of God is harmony. It's harmony in loving, caring relationships. The word joy then flows from the, the, the abiding sense of confidence that God is making everything all right as he establishes his kingdom. God is making everything all right as he establishes his kingdom. And this verse right here is the only place where all three of these words are all in together. The word righteousness, the word joy, and the word peace all together. So Paul then is making a real strong, powerful connection about these two words that are part of, not, 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 not to include, um, the, well, the two words that are part of the, the fruits of the Spirit is peace and joy. But Paul connected righteousness along with it. So it's a very, very po powerful connection. So God, God's righteous people have the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is what's going to empower us to surrender our own personal preferences. You see, sometimes the pride won't let you do that because this is what I want to do, and I'm going to do it anyhow. I mean, I don't, for an example, I don't, I don't smoke cigars. I don't like cigars. 
but there are some, uh, well, preachers and pastors that love to smoke cigars. And they go to cigar lounges and, and just enjoy Saturday night and just got a good sermon Sunday morning. Well, they see that as a liberty. I don't want to do that. So I'm not going to do that. Now to each his own, but that's not something that I want to do. Those things are lawful for me, but those things are not expedient. Those things are lawful for me, but those things don't edify. So I choose not to do it. You understand what I'm saying now? So to me, to me, to, because that's the way I feel, it comes against my conscience. If it comes against my conscience, then it's what? Sin to me. Y'all hear what I'm saying? Now, I know this is, you, you, gotta, you gotta dig into this deep to really understand this lesson. So life in the spirit then is a whole lot better, more, a whole lot more enjoyable and beneficial than my favorite food. In 18, Paul said, uh, he, that in, he that in these things, he that in these things served Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. So, so, so tending, looking out for the concerns of other people was the mode of operation of, of Jesus. It's all about serving other people. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And in the social structure of the, the first century AD Christian, Jewish, Jewish Christian, they stood apart. Stood apart from the larger Christian, the Jewish community, because they accepted the Gentiles into the brotherhood. And they accepted them as Christian brothers, as God's people. And then the Gentiles back at that time, also on their part, they put aside, they abandoned the pagan rush, uh, worship of the Roman Empire. And they, they, didn't, they didn't pledge allegiance to that flag, so to speak, and the loyalty to that organization, to that empire. So now if these two, what the commentary called renegade, renegade groups, became known for a big argument because over food, you shouldn't eat this, you shouldn't eat that. Well, their credibility then was going to be at risk. It was going to suffer. You see, when the church starts fighting and, and splitting and talking about one another, he's talking about that pastor, that pastor's talking about this pastor, they're talking about these, these members over here. When the church starts fighting and going on like this, the reputation is what's going to suffer. And folks going to say stuff like, why would I go down to that church? Because they argue more than we argue. Uh, you know, and they show sure enough ain't no salt and they ain't no light of the earth. I, I'm not going down there. In verse 19, Paul said, look, follow after the things which make for peace. Just, just God, God, in the, in the end, God's going to do all the judging. I'm telling you. Now, that doesn't say we can't correct a wrong. And we'll get to that in a moment. But run after peace. Run after the thing that's going to lift people up, that's going to edify them. The peace of God is a gift of God. But putting that peace into practice ain't automatic. That takes intentional effort. So Paul told his readers then, I want y'all to follow after. I want y'all to pursue peace. I want y'all to read 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. And, and then to pursue peace, they got to apply some diligent effort. They got to apply some to, to make sure that everybody in the body of Christ is number one, respected, number two, included, number three, loved. That's going to take some diligent, consistent effort. Now, having said that, conflict will be necessary when you got to deal with somebody that's, that's coming against the doctrinal truth. Doctrinal defect, de deflection is what the commentary calls it. Or moral deflection. Folks that are doing things with no internal compass at all. No shame in their sinful game you gotta you gotta tell the truth on that okay now they're gonna call they're gonna say you judging me wait a minute you just went down there and robbed the country store then you came to the city and robbed kroger's and then you tried to rob the bank and you say i'm judging you because i'm not judging you i'm just i'm simply saying you can't rob the bank and the, and the kroger's and, and everything else and and not go to jail that's wrong. That's not judging you. That's wrong. You can't drive 115 miles an hour and say, I was late for work. You judging a brother. No, the brother is, is reckless driving and you're going to be locked up. Oh, okay. So I understand that point. We'll we get to that in just a moment. If we have time, we'll get to that in just a moment as well. So, 
So, so more than more than just the the absence of conflict, peace means edifying, edifying your brother. Peace means building up one another. That's what peace is. And then in verse 20, Paul said, meet, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it's evil for that man that eat that stuff and then he's offended. You know, and then verse 20, verse 21 talks about it, it is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine. Look at, look at what Paul says nor anything that's going to make your brother stumble, offend him, make him get weak. So, so the opposite then of edify is to destroy. And today, today we may look, we look, look at that word offense or offended to mean something like irritate or insult. But the Greek word being translated right here uh, in terms of offense is the idea of causing a spiritual stumbling. You know, you know, class, if you got a particular, particularly if you got a position of authority and a lead in the church, a person that can be kind of weak can see you do something that in their mind, this is totally against the word of God and against, against my conscience, but you just turning it up, boy, you turning it up, you, you turning it up. And what the young folks said, you going down through there and turning it up. They're going to say, my goodness, what's going on in the church? I'm going to bring to a close in verse 23 when Paul said this. He that doubted is damned if he eat because he eat it not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith, Paul said in the word of God, is sin. So for those with the faith to affirm that all, everything you eat, this food is clean, the important matter is not, is not the food. The important, important matter is the conscience of the fellow believers. The important matter is not the food, but the conscience of the fellow believers. So, 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 some whose faith, whose faith is kind of weak, and who still believe that that some foods that they eat, those that food is unclean, and then they may follow the example and eat foods that they still believe is unclean because they're trying. They're saying what John over here is doing, what 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 Pastor John and and Missionary Mary is doing. So they said, I'm gonna go, I'm, I'm gonna just go down here and, and choke myself with I'm gonna I'm gonna eat so much till I get choked, okay? Because I don't see nothing wrong with it. So now now that's going, and in their mind, they're going against their conscience, and to them it's unclean. So if they if they go against their own conscience in this way, they have sin. Why? Because the actions that they do don't come from faith. If it don't come from faith, then it's from the sin nature. I know this is a whole lot of class, and we're about out of time here now. But I just want to—I want to say this in consideration of those that are, particularly babes in Christ. These folks have been saved now for thirty years, forty years, fifty years, and they walk right on the line. I mean, just right on the line. They, they say, "I can—I can go—I can go this far, but I can't go any farther." I know—I know I can do this, and I'm all right. I'm gonna take me a little wine for the stomach's sake, and that—that that joker got a whole bottle, okay. It's for the stomach. It's for the stomach's sake, all right. But but what you do behind your walls, listen. I'm not going. I'm not trying to legis legislate your morality. I can't do that. But 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 just think about. All of us have to think about those that can be offended, those that can be uh, hurt, those that can, we can cause them to stumble because of a liberty that we feel is okay for us. But is it going to affect my brother and cause them to fall? If it's going to cause my brother to fall. Isn't it worth it not to do it? Because Christ died for him or her too? To cause them to do something that can destroy their entire lifeline, their whole family? Because I'm saying I'm grown and he's grown and I'm going to do what I want to do? Well, hey, look, I hope y'all enjoyed the class today. Y'all have a great rest of the week and we look forward to seeing you again next week for our next Sunday School Review. Take care.